Well, it looks like a message that says it's being live streamed. Okay, um, why don't we go ahead and get started? So, uh, hello, welcome to uh, all of our START program fellows. Uh, I'm Matt Martin. I'm uh, the co-director of the, the START program, along with uh, Dr. Adrian Dan, who's the, the chair of our Bariatric Surgery Training Committee. Uh, we're really excited about all of you uh, being in the program. Uh, you've had a couple great webinars. We've got another great one tonight. We want a lot of good open discussion. Uh, and then our, our next meeting will be in person for the uh, hands-on training day in January. Uh, before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Shimke, who's moderating, just a couple quick announcements. Um, our March webinar uh, was scheduled for March 29th. Uh, we're going to be changing that to March 28th uh, due to the uh, lecturer's availability. Uh, we'll send out an email uh, with that change. Uh, don't forget the April and May webinars are, are going to be open houses. Uh, which are going to be great opportunities for us just to have some open discussion and uh, case review and video review. And uh, this will be an opportunity for some of you to present. So what we're probably going to do is, is split you up into two groups, uh, one responsible for April, one responsible for May. Uh, and we'll just identify a couple of you who will present a maybe a challenging case you had uh, or a video of a robotic uh, case that you did recently. Uh, and, and actually, Cases where you struggled or had problems are, are much better and more educational than the textbook uh, easy case, you know, in the, the BMI 31 patient that went uh, perfectly. Uh, and then finally, uh, don't forget this program also includes uh, funding you all to attend the uh, uh, 2023 ASMBS annual meeting. Uh, and we're going to have a, uh, a robotic session on the last day of the meeting. That's going to be June 29th. Um, we actually uh, uh, got uh, plenty of time uh, allocated to us and we're designing the program now, but uh, it's also going to include some opportunities uh, for some fellow presentations. Uh, we'll send out more details about that, but just uh, start thinking about that because we'll send out an email for submissions. Uh, and, and that would include things like uh, if you have a scientific abstract, you know, some, some analysis uh, of a robotic bariatric surgery topic you've done. Uh, or if you've got a, a great uh, video uh, case to present, we'll have some time in that session at the annual meeting uh, for you all to present, and we'll uh, we'll have a call for submissions for that. Um, so again, uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us again, and I'll turn it over to our moderator, Dr. Scott Shimke. All right. Well, thank you, Matt. And uh, we have uh, another great lecture ahead of us, and I'm excited to introduce uh, Dr. Shana Eckhouse. She's a uh, a good friend of mine and a fellow Blue Devil as well. Uh, she's a bariatric surgeon at Wash U in St. Louis, and she will be talking to us about uh, robotic duodenal switch and also uh, SADI, single anastomosis. Um, we all look forward to this lecture and a, a great discussion. If you have any questions, please put those in the chat, and we'll open that up at the end as well. Uh, so this is an interactive talk, so please uh, join in. And uh, without further ado, Dr. Ackhouse, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I am here at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm the Associate Director for Adult and Adolescent Bariatric Surgery um, and uh, an Associate Professor of Surgery here. Um, I am going to oh, uh, start with uh, a, a little bit different. Um, I have a lot of video because the duodenal switch has a lot to it. Um, and so my room setup, essentially, this is a schematic of our room setup that we have here. Um, where uh, actually the door would be at the bottom left hand, uh, hand side of the screen. We have dual consoles in every room, so we're able to teach on the go. Um, and we have RNFAs for all of our cases to pass instruments uh, for uh, state Missouri law and allowing uh, our trainees to get a significant amount of console time. Um, I uh, This is actually the picture of that room from the door. Um, and you can see the consoles are on the uh, corner on the left side. The robot comes in from the patient's right uh, at the right shoulder area. Um, and on the opposite side is usually where our endoscopy cart is. Um, just some more lovely pictures. Everybody knows what the XI looks like. Uh, for patient positioning, I do uh, both arms out with a footboard, um, significant number of secure straps. Our average BMI is 54 here. My average BMI for duodenal switches is closer to about 60 
to six uh, at 64 actually. Um, and so we, uh, uh, and I don't stage them. I put uh, two straps plus some tape around the arms to, uh, to around the legs, excuse me, to uh, uh, keep them secure. And we put two straps around each arm and we always check positioning with kind of a test and reverse Trendelenburg before moving forward with the case. Um, after intub uh, intubation, I am an NG tube fan. Uh, one of my partners um, uses a Visi-G instead. Either way can be done. And then we have created a formal timeout system midway through the case before we do a stomach stapling that is led by us as uh, four gut and bariatric surgeons, but anybody operating on the stomach to make sure that everything is out of the nose, the mouth, and the stomach due to um, some historical issues. Uh, my port placement um, I use a Nathanson. Um, one of my partners uses the stitch, which I think we've seen um, using an 18 inch V-lock um, in some of our other videos. I find with um, some of our larger BMI patients the Nathanson helps with the heaviness and exposing uh, the angle of hiss a little bit better um, considering my camera is in midline. I use a uh, five uh, working ports, an assistant port just because of the uh, how I approach the case and four uh, uh, robotic trocars. Um, usually uh, my arm one and three are 12 millimeters and then the other, uh, the rest are eights. Um, and most of the time, the positioning of that eight millimeter camera is somewhere about 22 to 25 centimeters below the xiphoid process. I enter the abdomen um, with the left eight millimeter trocar and I can adjust up and down from there um, to make sure I like where my camera port is. Because one of the things that I think can be a struggle with duodenal switch is the ileostomy and having adequate exposure to get that completed. And so I find that I have the most wiggle room with um, arm four um, and the positioning of that port, which is why I use that one first and then position somewhere between 22 and 25 centimeters from there. Uh, prior to docking, I typically pay, uh, place the patient somewhere between 12 and 15 to 16 degrees of reverse, reverse Trendelenburg. And then I actually do a little bit of uh, airplane left side up, usually it's two to three degrees because the midline camera port makes it a little harder to see around the angle of hiss to the left cruise of the diaphragm uh, for the uh, sleeve gastrectomy component of the case. Um, and then I uh, bring in the robot with the laser lines kind of oriented over arm two, which again is my camera port. Um, and then we dock uh, and ensure at least one fist of clearance uh, between each arm. So I use a lot of instruments, and this is something we are working on paring down, but um, it, it'll become clear when I go through the steps of my operation for a duodenal switch. Um, arm one um, is typically my cardier, um and is a stapling port. Arm two is always my camera. Arm three is my workhorse um, and also can be a, a stapling port. And arm four is typically um, always my tip up. And I try, I've played around with keeping arm one and arm four um, consistent and then switching them uh, uh, due to uh, the series of events for my procedure. Um, and this is what's worked best for me. Um, love to get feedback at the end or throughout the presentation, please interrupt. Um, so my steps, um, I am a traditionalist with a duodenal switch. I uh, run the small bowel first. Um, and while I say I'm a traditionalist because I take out the gallbladder, I don't have traditional limb lengths. And this is based on some of my training at Duke where uh, the traditional was 100 centimeters. Um, and then due to some malnutrition um, trends, we extended our common channel to 200 centimeters. Um, and that, um, while I was not there uh, for it to be studied after finishing fellowship, it's something I'm currently tracking because um, I actually reverse a lot of duodenal switches from the community um, due to malnutrition and lack of close follow-up. My rear limb is typically 150 centimeters. And if I'm considering a single anastomosis duodenal switch, I'm gonna do, my goal is a common channel of 300 centimeters. Now, this is where I have to give a big caveat. We do not have insurance um, coverage for a single anastomosis duodenal switch in uh, the state of Missouri. And so I've stuck with traditional duodenal switch and my typical MO, if I'm like, well, I may try a Sadie is uh, I'll outline that the ilio ileostomy was too challenging due to uh, positioning or habitus of the patient. Um, but that's happened once in the last uh, five years. Um, I do perform a cholecystectomy on everybody, cause, partly because if I don't, my GI ability team may kill me if I ever ask them to do a, a retrograde transjejunal ERCP um, for potential um, chole, uh, uh, stones in the uh, common bile duct. Um, and so I like getting that out. Um, 
that is um, significantly variable and there is data showing that that doesn't necessarily need to be done and can save you time. Uh, then I do my gastric and duodenal dissection um, all at once. I complete the sleeve gastrectomy. Um, I do it over a 54 French bougie um, for a Sadie that's typical or a single anastomosis duodenal switch is typically over a 40 French bougie. And then I perform my duodenal ileostomy and in an a mega loop fashion and then complete with an ileo ileostomy for the traditional duodenal switch. I am going to air my dirty laundry. Um, I have a, a traditional, a better running of the bowel. Um, my historical trends of running bowel were laparoscopically. I switched this year to running it robotically. Um, I would run the bowel first, tack it up, and then dock the robot, which is actually how I was trained in fellowship, and switched this year after playing around with a different approach. Um, my hard drive corrupted uh, probably sometime in the last month or two. And you can see here that I, while I'm running it in a counterclockwise way, my mesentery is not oriented correctly. So airing it, but I'm showing it. Um, ultimately, while I realize this, I keep going because I'm already marking it out. So I'll go to 200 centimeters and then I'm going to place two stay sutures um, that I use consistently. Um, for me, they're important so that I don't create a ruin O or keep a twist in the uh, mesentery as you see here. And I do have a, a normal video that I can show you that just hasn't quite 100% downloaded. Um, the um, marking stitches that I do, I do a single long proximal and a double distal every time. And we write that on the board at every case. Um, I know other people have used um, clips or other markers. I'm a big fan of marking here when I real, you know, as I realizing I'm trying to undo it and I'm going the wrong direction, I will ultimately flip the mesentery um, down, as you see, finally fixing my problem. I flip it up eventually, and then I continue to run it in a counterclockwise direction, which is, I'm not there at the fixing it yet, but we're almost there. And now you can see me fixing it appropriately in the mesentery is starting to sit the way it's supposed to, going the wrong direction, now going back to the correct direction, and you can see it fillet or splay out nicely. And again, airing my dirty laundry, so I will show you, I can show you a normal one as well. There are my sutures, um, distal is down that way, and now I'm going back, and we're going to continue to run proximally, which will Perfect. And that's the orientation. But the important part is having your mesentery splayed, which I did not do at the beginning, and running consistently in a counterclockwise progression. Um, so that proximal is screen right and distal is screen left. Again, I use those marking sutures um, for my uh, the proximal end, which will be ultimately to my root limb. I use a, a temporary stay stitch uh of whatever i have in the belly usually it's just a silk to do the um uh just to keep my omega loop up as i move forward with my sleeve okay so then i perform a cholecystectomy and i cut this down to a minute um i have found that uh, when i look back uh over 30 percent of my patients have actually had g uh gallbladder pathology this lady had um a high drops of her gallbladder actually um we are, uh, the one thing I'm working on switching is instead of using the hook here, I have uh, decided on my next one, I'm gonna use a um, pair of scissors to try to decrease my instrument exchanges. But uh, I get the critical view. This can be a little bit more challenging of a um, exposure because of having a little bit of left-sided up and then due to the sheer weight of the liver. I clip in a traditional manner, two clips down, one clip up um, using the robotic clip applier. And I have switched to using, instead of clips on the uh, um, cystic artery, I use typically the vessel sealer to divide the uh, cystic artery now. And just taking gallbladder off the liver bed and eventually getting to do the nice lateral kerplunk and we're done. Um, I then move on uh, to a, uh, performing my dissection of the stomach and the um, duodenum. We'll, uh, go through uh, the showing you the dissection partly because uh, the ports may be similar for some of you and different for others. I don't move my camera. Um, I have seen it where people move camera from uh, arm two to arm three for duodenal switches because you're operating on the left and the right side. I keep it the same and try to minimize that exchange. Um, 
And so uh, I find it because I typically, when I do robotic sleeves, which I don't do a lot of because I can do them faster laparoscopically, I have arm two and arm three switched. Um, you can see as you come around um, the cardia coming up, it can be a little bit harder visualization. That's where uh, having a little bit of left-sided up of, for the table at two or three degrees has really helped me out. Um, and um, then I go all the way up and I do a dissection until I can see the left cruise of the diaphragm. From here, I'll go back down and uh, do an anti-grade dissection from the uh, pre-pyloric antrum to the duodenal bulb. And I kept this video a, a little longer specifically so you can see the dissection. Um, I take it all the way down. I find this to be the simplest and most reproducible and the easiest to train my fellows on. You can see I identified um, the pylorus there. I continue to take down kind of those inferior and posterior attachments of the duodenal bulb. Um, and uh, as I continue down my uh, for duodenal switch, and actually I use the same for Sadie, my uh, landmark for stopping my dissection is the GDA posteriorly. Um, I'm gonna get into a little bit of bleeding, I think on the next bite. Um, basically it's a branch, probably a little small branch perforator. No, not yet, I think it's this one. Um, but it's easily controlled with a little bit of, um, um, just compression with arm one. And again, uh, since this video, um, which was uh, not the one I wanted to show, um, I have switched arm one and arm four consistently where my cardiac is always in arm four and my, or my cardiac is always in arm one and my tip ups always on arm four for consistency and uh, uh, decreased transitions. We get that bleeding controlled and I start to take down my posterior attachments and um, there are always a little, uh, lots of little branch perforators here. It tends to be a very vascular area. So you just want to take your time. We use, instead of bringing a Raytech in, um, we open these, uh, what we call cigars, um, but they're based up, rolled up, basically rolled up Raytex that fit. Um, you can pass through an eight millimeter, but they're very challenging to take out a 12 millimeter trocar. Um, so once it's in, I usually keep it until the end of the case. Um, any retained specimens, I call a ravioli. I'm in St. Louis where toasted ravioli reigns supreme. So um, this will be my, uh, as of right now, second ravioli in the belly. First one is the gallbladder. Here you can start me, uh, see me to go a little bit more posteriorly. Um, as we do this dissection, the structures you have to think about posterior to your um, duodenal bulb and you can see the GDA coming in and you can see me kind of pointing it out. We're gonna take down that just little layer right uh, posteriorly, just anterior the GDA, um, but the GDA is gonna come into your uh, hepatic. So that's usually just superior and posterior uh, to the duodenal bulb and the common bile duct can be right behind you as well. So structures you wanna be really cognizant of and mindful of as you do this dissection. And then importantly, as you staple. Um, I believe there are a few videos out there showing kind of those unfortunate experiences where he gotten into both of those structures. And you can see me pointing, or actually my fellow currently who's doing the dissection, this is her first time doing the dissection, um, uh, pointing out the GDA and then starting to come uh, from posterior to superior above uh, uh, the duodenal bulb. And I'm showing all these devils in the details. This is probably, uh, I think, the hairiest part of the case, maybe the toughest to get comfortable with. Um, to continue the dissection, um, sometimes if I'm struggling, I use a Nathanson liver retractor, which I did not mention. Um, because my ports are a little bit towards the patient left, it does not create collisions with the um, robot. But I will use a stitch um, to lift up the falciform so I have better exposure. Um, I've also used um, arm four, kind of the back end of arm four or the back end of arm one to lift it up as well, kind of using it dual purpose. Here I'm taking down that anterior peritoneum. You can see the common bile duct right po just posterior to where I'm working right now. Um, and just got to be, again, very careful um, and with start to feel with your eyes, if you will, as many uh, robotic surgeons talk about. Um, 
and you can see kind of the pulsation of the common hepatic going um, uh, just proximal to where the GDA comes off. You can see me starting to come around and I have that nice plane. I think while many people would have been like, ooh, you didn't need to take down that last layer of uh, small tissue posteriorly, I do think it helped get us into that area. And I will take some of those small little uh, vessels superiorly down as well to make sure I can make a big enough window and feel comfortable that I'm not gonna do anything um, to, again, those major structures you don't want to um, injure. Um, frequently, especially higher BMI, this uh, patient's BMI was uh, 55. You're not able to see the common uh, bile duct and um, kind of those portal structures as well. And you can see them very well here, which is both um, scary on the cases where you don't see it sometimes, um, but comforting when you know exactly where it is and you can avoid it. Um, I already have my window, but I want to make it a little bigger. I do um, uh, want to be able to drive a truck. I have seen people put vessel loops to make it easier. Um, so to make it easier to pass the stapler. Um, I am still a staple line reinforcement person. I know um, our colleagues that have shown their procedures do not use them. Here you can see that we put our the 54 French bougie. I use a taper tip it passed without issues and I use a stapler to help position it. Um, and then we just staple up along uh, the curve, keep, keeping the stomach the way I discuss it uh, as flat as a pancake so we don't spiral the staple line. Um, and um, I'm not, I'm, while I'm filleting the stomach out, I'm not pulling on it, I'm keeping it um, tight, but we don't wanna over tighten it because of uh, the shear force of the robot. Uh, stay, sleeve done. So I showed you as little as possible of the sleeve. Um, and now we'll go to the duodenal ileostomy. Um, so next we divide, um, I, I divide uh, the duodenal bulb. Um, and I pass this, I'm very particular about how this passes through. I um, typically, and this was a, my fellow and I had a long discussion about this one. I usually pass the anvil through, not the cartridge through because of the sheer size. Um, and uh, uh, with the anvil and the light, uh, you know, big enough space that we created, uh, it's typically not difficult to get um, the anvil through. In um, certain situations, and um, uh, it can be helpful to get, uh, uh, sometimes if I've really struggled, I'll actually undock that arm and use the uh, our, a little bit of uh, the Medtronic gold tipped uh, purple load can be really nice, uh, which is medium uh, length staples. If I'm really struggling with that area, because you can use the tip to get through. I haven't done that in two years, but it is a trick when you're starting out that can be helpful if you're struggling with a robotic stapler. Me pointing out the vessels that we're trying to ignore again. Um, now we're bringing up the loop, taking out that temporary stay stitch. I use arm four to hold the omega loop up. Uh, again, the rule limb, uh, the eventual rule limb is to screen left and um, the BP limb is to screen right. And we're doing a two-layered hand-sewn anastomosis. I use absorbable V-lock that absorbs over 180 days for uh, both layers. Um, I'll run this layer first. I'm sorry for the blue dot that's in there as I'm telling the fellow where I want to go. I start um, this stitch on the small bowel near the mesen uh, mesenteric border. Um, and then I take three sutures typically, uh, and then I secure it down, kind of thinking that I'm ballooning it down like a vascular anastomosis. Uh, so this is the third one before we'll actually cinch it down. And you can cinch it. Um, one of the things that uh, you have to be cognizant of is that back suture uh, when you cinch sometimes doesn't completely cinch. Um, if I don't like the way it's sitting and it's probably fine, but in my head, if you're not gonna be able to sleep at night, then you need to do something about it. You wanna make sure um, the outcomes are good. I'll put an extra stitch superiorly between the duodenal, at the end of the duodenum and the um, omega loop of the ileum. Once I complete this back row, um, and we use, it's a 3-0 V-lock, so it's very easy to break. 
um, without scissors. Uh, this is me putting that extra suture in because I don't like how it's laying down. Um, I find that is the weak point of this anastomosis is that superior aspect. Um, and so I tend to overthink it. And maybe it's because that's where I've seen leaks in the past. I then mark out my duodenotomy and my ileotomy. Um, I use hot scissors. And again, um, one of my improvement opportunities uh, for uh, my coming up cases is to get rid of the hook completely and just use hot scissors. Um, but we'll make our enterotomies and just kind of take our time. And you can use the scissors both to get in and then to do a little bit of spreading as well. I typically use um, a combination of kind of cut and coag depending on what I'm doing. And this is the unfun part. Um, I make the duodenal uh, or duodenotomy uh, pretty big and wide, and I make the ileotomy a little bit smaller just due to the elasticity of this uh, small intestine or the ileum. Um, it's much more elastic, and so you can end up with a size mismatch. And um, so you can see I'll purposely size it down. This one's a little bit maybe bigger than normal for me. Yeah, that's about right. and the lovely bleeding. So we'll use a little coag and get it controlled. And then we keep going. One of the um, sentinel mistakes that I made early in doing um, robotic duodenal switch is going through and through the ileum. Um, again, I'll air all my dirty laundry. Uh, it's better to learn from the mistakes I've made. Don't learn, don't try not to make the ones that I've made because I bear, uh, not thinking about how deep I went as I was cutting or using coag with the scissors. I went, um, and made an injury posteriorly. So had a positive leak flip test resected and reconstructed, um, which adds an unfortunate amount of time to the case. Um, I typically do two, um, sutures for my inner layer. And I start about one, uh, I don't start quite 50, 50 in the middle. I start a little bit on the superior aspect, kind of, uh, one third, two thirds, two thirds, inferiorly, one third, uh, superiorly. Um, I start with a baseball stitch. And as I come around the, uh, the corner, um, superiorly, I will switch to a canal and I'll canal all the, uh, that top corner. Once I get the top corner canaled and I'm onto the anterior aspect, um, I start my second suture. Um, I have done, uh, my partner does this all in one, with one suture instead of two. Um, it starts at the top, comes all the way down and comes back to the top. Um, you're only as good as your last complication. Another one of the issues I've had with doing it that way is I had a leak superiorly. Hence, you see me putting that extra suture in at the top and um, overthinking that area. And so I've stuck with a two layer approach. So this is me coming around uh, again, still superiorly with that initial stitch. I'm gonna start the second stitch now, uh, finish the posterior row and um, come around anteriorly with this suture. All right, uh, I'll just skip ahead a little bit. Let's see where we're at if I go to here. Yeah, a little bit of bleeding from an, uh, a needle hole, but we're coming around. Uh, uh, and then once I get to the anterior aspect, I typically will start to, I'll canal um, or baseball stitch either way, uh, depending on how it's coming together. Um, here I canal um, the majority of the way um, in uh, from inferior to superior. And when I bring the second stitch, I start to baseball it. Um, that one I tend to play by ear, just depending on how the suture is laying. Um, a lot of places may not teach duodenal switch. Um, if you're able to do a gallbladder, a sleeve and a gastric bypass, you can do a duodenal switch. Um, it's just basically you're combining all three surgeries in one. And if you are, uh, being trained at an institution where, uh, they're more modern than I am and they don't take out the gallbladder, then it's just combining a sleeve with a gastric bypass, essentially. Um, and from a skill set perspective, the, the learning is more, in my opinion, from the dissection and then how to manage the uh, patients perioperatively uh, from a nutritional perspective, uh, because compliance is key uh, to um, patients doing well. 
once I, um, That's so damn funny. You can see we're just finishing up. I keep that anterior layer, layer a little bit loose so that I can finish um, and make sure I have good uh, full thickness bites. Uh, and once I have exactly what I want, I will um, cinch it down. Um, I am left-handed and so I encourage um, uh, my residents and fellows and um, to work with both hands. And you can always, if you're able to robotically and lap, you can always sew forehanded that way. I'm using both hands. And I will, um, I only use one needle driver, uh, partly for cost savings, partly because I feel more comfortable manipulating the bow with Cartier. And you can sew pretty comfortably with a Cartier or a um, vessel sealer, um, which I will do if something unexpected happens. Um, despite it being um, VLOC, I, uh, VLOC is not FDA approved for a knotless anastomosis technically. So I always tie a knot um, for my inner layer. And then I do a second, um, an anterior layer uh, uh, running uh, Lembert. Um, and I don't tie these anterior posterior layers. Now I do that for the DI and I'm gonna cheat and do something different on the II because I was trying something different. Um, we have had a, and it was based on, um, and you may know this based on one of the questions that I asked during our um, uh, Dr. Shimke's talk on the uh, gastric bypass, we've had a string of bowel obstructions in our practice here, whether it's lap or robotic um, duodenal switch or gastric bypass. And so um, we've been trying different approaches to closing and orienting the small bowel to try to improve um, uh, the incurrences of bowel obstruction. So we've tried a few different things. Um, and I tried a different thing in this case uh, that I'll, you'll be seeing very shortly. So this is, I think, my last or second to last stitch. Um, I use the uh, staple line reinforcement partly because it uh, to use a Jin Yu thing um, at Duke, it's something you can hold on to. It's nice. And I think it's helpful for being, being able to manipulate um, the... Uh, anastomosis without messing with the bowel as much. So now I'm going to run the bowel again in a counterclockwise way uh, uh, from the screen left side, which I know is going to be my rule limb until I go back and find my two marking sutures, remembering um, double distal uh, and single proximal, which is more superior. I'll put a stay stitch between um, the BP limb and the um, uh, the eventual rule limb, because at this point I have not divided my omega loop, which is something I've also optimized um, since this video. I, I divide my omega loop before making my ileo ileostomy now. Um, it's a time savings. It makes it easier for closing your mesenteric defects as well. And I do find it, it's a little bit easier to manipulate the bowel for um, putting um, the uh, stapler in for the ileo ileostomy. Um, that stay stitch allows for tension and counter tension, and then we'll manipulate um, the small bowel in, and that stay stitch also allows for pulling on um, uh, the small bowel for the anastomosis. I always find this, um, you know, if somebody has some good feedback here, I find this to be the, one of the harder things to do is to feed the small bowel into the stapler. Um, without having two stay stitches, which is a um, something my partner does, which I'm thinking about trying, where um, you put a, a stay stitch above and below your enterotomy um, to make it easier to manipulate. Um, but again, just trying to come up with different ways uh, to uh, make that more efficient. And then we close the common enterotomy with a running suture. Um, I baseball stitch it, I don't canal it. Um, which is, uh, I'm actually the only one here who does baseball stitch it. Um, both my partners can this layer. Um, I believe in small bites. Um, I call them peds bites. You just need to get a good bite of serosa and try to dunk the mucosa down. And I try to um, uh, uh, cinch it down after every three sutures. And you just have to be careful with the loops. Um, the ileal ileostomy, I think can be the most variable component of this procedure. Uh, just because of how the small bowel will lay. Um, I find that usually I'm doing the anastomosis where I'm stapling through arm three, but I um, have had times where I've stapled through arm one. Um, 
And then if you were going to do, uh, if from my perspective, if you're going to do a SADIE, the only difference with what I've shown you so far is you wouldn't be doing this anastomosis. I would, in my practice, I still take out the gallbladder. Um, uh, I, I do perform a sleeve over a 40 French bougie if I were uh, planning for a SADIE. Um, I just can't get it covered. And so um, the only times I've done a SADIE are um, when this anastomosis is uh, a struggle and I'm not getting the uh, right degrees of freedom for my robotic instruments because I'm looking straight down. So this was one of our trials. Um, instead of doing just a single layer, um, uh, we were, I did a running Lembert. Um, I stopped doing it. I just do a, a true single layer now. And then, although I said, um, <laughs> Uh, VLOC is not FDA approved for a knotless anastomosis. I make a knotless anastomosis here. Um, uh, this was a discussion between me and my fellow and I actually haven't done it since. Um, but it does make for a really pretty anastomosis. Um, and considering kind of how small and deliberate we are with the bites, there's no narrowing of the anastomosis, especially because we put those common neurotomies just a little bit off the anti-mesenteric border. Um, I've used typically either a needle driver or the vessel sealer to make my um, uh, mesenteric window. I find this to be a lot easier to make that mesenteric window when I do it before I make my ileo ileostomy, which is again why I've switched, um, like most people already do. Um, and once I've divided this, I have a true uh, duodenal switch where my rule limb is um, uh, going distally um, screen right and down, and then comes back up to the ileo ileostomy in that omega loop manner. And I typically do not divide the um, mesentery. Um, because of, uh, I've had uh, my own uh, internal hernia on a duodenal switch where I did not close the space. I have now started to consistently close uh, Peterson space on all duodenal switches. I also close the space if I'm considering leaving somebody as a loop. Um, while the incidence of an internal hernia is significantly lower with a loop anastomosis, it's not zero. Um, and um, I, I'd rather be as safe as I can. Um, it can be a challenging stitch to um, expose because of the weight of the omentum. And um, with a duodenal switch, something I don't do, I don't split the omentum. Usually there aren't any reach issues with it. Uh, it, you know, undivided, especially since we're coming over um, um, on the patient's screen left, but patient's right side where the omentum is usually um, thinner. I close uh, the uh, ileo ileostomy mesenteric defect, which is a very broad defect, and I go from uh, base up. Um, and typically, once I get to the top, uh, I run um, the V lock back one so I can cut it right at the mesentery. Um, due to leaving a, a tip or a tail up a couple of times and actually having that create a uh, bowel obstruction um, one or two years post-op, which I swear never happened in fellowship, but of course it's happened to me since I've been in practice. And essentially that is my duodenal switch. Due to sheer length, I didn't put any metrics in um, because I knew this was gonna be a longer video session. Uh, specimen removal, we're going to, we're going to skip and let's get to questions. Um, talk through some of my optimizations that I've been doing again, my tip up stay in arm four, um, having a 12 millimeter trocar on arm one and three to accommodate the, um, the ileal, uh, ileal ileostomy, just in case there's variability in how the bowel comes up and, um, the location of my, um, uh, ports and then dividing the root limb and uh, from BP before creating that ileal ileostomy. I'm also a big fan of bundling sutures and needles. I've been playing around with how many to bring in. I never like to bring in more than four at a time. Um, uh, four in, four out is the most I do. And I keep them, uh, which you didn't see for sheer time. I keep them on the uh, patient's abdominal wall just below the rib cage on the um, screen um, right or patient's left abdominal wall. Happy to answer questions. All right. I, I've written down a whole list of questions. I saw you frantically writing and it was stressing me out. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's good. I mean, this, I, this is a great operation and I get excited to see how other people do it. And I'm taking notes on how to make myself better as well. So, um, but thank you. Um, one thing before I get to questions and reviewing what you've done, 
Do you want to go over your post-operative course, what you do? Uh, yeah. So um, we have a standardized pathway. All the patients, whether they're getting a sleeve bypass or duodenal switch are very standardized. Um, we call it our rainbow pathway. Why? Because it's actually a sheet where all the, it's all the colors of the rainbow for different days, like pre-op, um, uh, new, uh, pre-op uh, in, um, sorry, anesthesia vision, pre-op, um, intra-op, post-op day zero, one, um, and one slash two. Our patients go home typically post-op day one, 60% of the time, the other 40% to stay till post-op day two. We have a fairly morbid um, patient population that have um, high rates of diabetes and heart failure and uh, NASH cirrhosis um, uh, compared to the other areas of our region. Um, we uh, start uh, a scopolamine patch and um, uh, I'm blanking on the three-day oral um, anti-nausea medication that's used for chemotherapy. We prescribe that and started at 8 p.m. the night before surgery. We give Celeprex uh, Celebrex, Tylenol, and gabapentin in uh, uh, in pre-op holding uh, about two hours prior to surgery, along with a heparin shot. Post-operatively, they're put on a limited clear liquids immediately post-op and do, thank you, uh, Dr. Hassan, amend. I don't know why I couldn't remember that. I've been blanking on names all week. Um, and then uh, post-operatively, they're immediately started on liquids. We do a multimodal pain pathway where um, they're on scheduled Levzin, Flexeril, Celebrex, Tylenol, and oxycodone's PRN. We continue scheduled Zofran. We have PRN Kropmazine. We have issues with getting Phenergan in our hospital. We don't use it. Um, and they go home with all those medications except Celebrex because we strongly discourage NSAID use. Um, and we've kept it standardized for ease of teaching um, classes. Um, our patients go home on a full liquid diet post-op day one to two. Uh, for duodenal switches, um, I do uh, the protein advancement a little bit differently. The diet advancement's the same. They're on a full liquid diet for the first seven to 10 days at 60 grams of protein is the goal. And then we see them back at seven to 10 days after surgery. At that point, we advance them to a pureed diet for two weeks and then a soft diet for two weeks. And during that time, our goal is to get them up to 80 grams of protein. And then they see us back at five to six weeks post-op and our goal is to get them up to hundred to 120 grams of protein at that point, trying to give them a little bit more realistic goals um, so that as they get a little further out, they need to get more protein in. Um, and then uh, regarding um, vitamins and minerals, I'm a, uh, this is one instance where I do think some of the bariatric vitamin um, formulas are better than over the counter. I don't know about near areas of the country, finding an over the counter fat soluble vitamin aquadec has become very challenging. Um, and then it also adds up to, I think it's like nine pills a day. If you go over the counter or prescription mm -hmm. for a lot of patients, that's a ton where you can get a uh, pro care or bariatric Paul, uh, pal have 1199 a month or, um, 1099 to 1199 a month formulations where it has the multivitamin B12 iron and fat soluble vitamin all in one. Um, and, and for that cost. Um, that's cheaper than what you can even get over the counter fat soluble vitamins at just that one. So it's a cost savings for them if they're able to do it. Um, and then they do have to get calcium in separately. Uh, I think those are my big takeaways. I really try to avoid using over the counter vitamins because of the sheer volume and size that they are. And that's where bariatric pal and ProCare have made it easier. Um, I'm happy to share uh, those links with you guys as well. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, not even for the fellows. I'm also curious. Uh, our dietitians kind of run our uh, the vitamin show, so to speak, in conjunction with uh, me and the surgeons. And we still have too many pills. And so I would like to to see your regimen. So I think that's uh, that's a great tip because managing these patients. I mean, the, the operation is obviously it's a great operation, has its technical pitfalls uh, and complications. But once you get them on the operating room, you're not out of the woods yet, right? There's a potential whole laundry list of issues that you can have, uh, especially with the vitamins. So, yeah. um, but, uh, I digress a little bit, um, kind of going back to the beginning, a uh, few things, and I think something's showing up in the chat here and I'll look at that as well. Good. Um, uh, we do procare. Oh, okay. Um, the, when I target for the duodenal switch, I also find it helpful. And I used to do the same thing you did, Chana. I did, uh, laparoscopically. I ran the bowel first and then I switched to robotic. One of the mm -hmm. things that really helped me is I target the gallbladder or even further screen left or patient right, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Uh, so you target kind of way away from where you really think you're operating, but it actually sets the robot up uh, for less clashing, especially at the very beginning when you have to go dive down 
uh, to identify the TI, which sometimes can be the hardest part of the operation is just finding that TI. It's easy to get yourself confused. I have a second video that's just beautiful um, in the interest of, I'll share it with you guys. Um, I have it down to four minutes, um, but uh, I, it's not easy. I find doing it laparoscopically a little bit easier. I think it's really fun to watch my fellows try to operate laparoscopically and tie from um, that side of the table. But admittedly, I think being able to do it either lap and robotic is really important. Um, and uh, it's a struggle. I, I think that's one of the hardest things to learn how to do. It's also one of the most important things to do is being able to get down to that um, ileocecal valve and run the bowel retrograde. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> it's actually when I had a fellow start with uh, me, uh, I don't let them actually find the TI at first because uh, with a robot, you you have to feel with your eyes, so to speak. And the last thing you want to do is grab the TI or somewhere down there and cause uh, an injury, you know, to 10 seconds into your case. So um, the aside from just kind of the literature, do you have any personal experience with why you do 300 for Sadie, uh, the common channel, so to speak, versus 350 elementary for the switch? Or is that just? It's my practice pattern um, that I and it's. It partly goes back to fellowship where um, Dana Portnier was running it to uh, the common channel uh, for traditional DS, uh, uh, it, which makes it not a traditional DS. A traditional DS common channel is 75 centimeters to 100, 70, 75 to 100 centimeters. Mm -hmm. um, but the malnutrition, malabsorption rates are up to 7 to 15%. And so, and when you look at the literature on reversing a duodenal switch, Gagne's series, which is currently the largest, not going to be for long, of six patients, he would chop the rule limb off and plug it in hundred centimeters more approximately, and it would improve. So con combining that series of six and my patient, kind of my experience as a fellow is why I do a 200 centimeter common channel. I have, uh, I've done, I've gotten one Sadie approved. So I did it the way it's described other than that, they've all been denied. And so I do a DS unless again, I'm really struggling with the ileal ileostomy because it can be very hard to get all the way up to the angle of his and down to the ilium. I think my, and I'd love to get feedback because I think my own personal technical pitfalls, I think the duodenal ileostomy is probably the easiest part of that case, but you set it up to make it the easiest part of the case. I think the hardest part of that case is the ileal ileostomy. And so if it's a real struggle, I'll say, you know what, it's not worth it if I don't it, um, to struggle. And then I'll do a Sadie with a 350 centimeter common channel. No, I, I, one thing that you mentioned in, in that I do, and I have done is I divide the Omega loop first after doing the DI mm -hmm. and uh, for better or for worse, I, I put a stitch and I grab that, uh, the two limbs of bowel really drag it all the way up to essentially it's almost above the DI. Um, so it really sets it up nicer for the II. Um, mm -hmm. you know, some patients, absolutely, it's easier than others. And I will staple either through arm three or arm one to yeah. do that. Uh, and it just depends on how it sets it up and you have a 12 in e either. So um, yeah, yeah it, it can definitely get tricky. And at the times dragging on and you have a massive BMI patient and you just want to get them off the OR table, it's it's my last two BMIs problem. have been over 70. I've done the whole thing and mm -hmm. I'm just like, it's painful. Um, when you're struggling for that, um, totally agree. Yeah, definitely. Um, have you ever used ICG? Um, I have dabbled with that using that to identify the uh, biliary anatomy for doing the gallbladder and then also the common bile duct when you do your DI. Mm -hmm. I have not. Uh, my partner does. Um, she uses um, ICG for everything. I um, I don't have a good reason as to why. I think it makes a lot of sense for identifying that common bile duct because that should be a never event. But, um, um, uh, that's where I really take that time. Um, and I think the important part when you're learning is taking the time to do that dissection. You don't want to take all the blood. I personally don't believe you should take all the blood supply down, um, superior to the duodenum, but you do want to make it a big enough window. So you're not dragging anything inferiorly. And that's why what you saw where I put the cartridge through, flip it, make it the anvil. It's easier. And then take your time, wiggle it in. If you make that a bigger space. And sometimes, you know what, if I'm not able to get it all the way through, that's okay. I will take it in two um, just to make sure I don't do anything dumb. I don't want to make a common bile duct injury. The last thing I want to be doing is calling my transplant and HPV surgeon saying, hey, guess what I did today? Oh, by the way, their BMI is, you know, much higher than you're used to. Um, the, the one that can be scary, and actually it was in my last duodenal switch that I did um, two Mondays ago, um, I... Um, 
the common hepatic was much closer than I realized. And I started dissecting and I, I got off track and I got a little bit too medial actually. Um, and so as I was dissecting, I got a branch straight, uh, or what looked, I think it wasn't a branch off of it, but I was getting close. And once I got that controlled, all of a sudden I was like, oh, there's the common hepatic. Oh, there's the GDA coming off. And it's one of those, like, you're, you're not feeling very comfortable in the inside moments where you just take that step back, take the deep breath, realize you didn't do anything wrong and get yourself back on track to the GDA. That's one of the reasons I think the GDA is so helpful is it prevents you from doing anything dumb with the common hepatic. All right. Um, let's, let's jump into some fellow questions here and see kind of, uh, what they, uh, they have, uh, on their minds. Uh, first things is from John. Uh, this is a good question, right? So there's going to be a lot of revisions where sleeves come back for, uh, weight regain or whatnot. We don't have to talk about all that, but when you're doing a second stage DS, uh, do you make any adjustments in the setup or poor positioning? If you're just doing the second stage and they've already had the sleeve? No, I don't because, um, I, the setup I have is really focused in on doing it over the, um, where the ease I've set everything up for the DI. Um, and since that's what I'm doing for the revision, I set it up the same. Um, I'm less likely to have an assistant port when I'm just doing it, uh, 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 the DI and the II. Um, uh, but other than that, I do it the same. So that's the one maybe adjustment I would do is just take that eight millimeter choke car out. Yeah. I I've played around in one of the 12 millimeters. You can actually put down to an eight, uh, cause you don't need an extra stapling port necessarily, but you know, I, what, is that a huge difference? That's debatable, but yeah, otherwise I do the same setup as well. Um, um oh yeah, Monique. Oh, this is a good question. What do you use for accurate measuring of the bowel? So I'm going to show you another video you set me up, but it's not, so I'm just going to share my iMovie. Um, can you see that right now? Yes. And while she's pulling that up, if other fellows have questions, please uh, put them in the chat or uh, raise your hand or something. And we'll, we'll get to those as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. Better yet unmute and yeah, just question. jump right in. So finding the TI here, and you can see I have umbilical tape in the belly. So one of the things I've been playing around with and I, I um, is using umbilical tape, which is 50 centimeters in length and just doing that four times. And you can see it's not hard to do. Um, and it makes it very accurate. Otherwise you're very inaccurate. I go back and forth on whether I need to be this accurate. I realize that's probably controversial, but, um, this is one technique that I've used to be more accurate. Happy to hear what others do. Um, and you can see that much nicer. I'm a, clockwise I'm a pessimist you. there. And could you can stretch the ball and all that too. I think it's helpful, but, um, I don't know. I, I think we talk a lot about limb lengths and in the end, you know, I think doesn't matter. It's a very the extremes matter, but there's mm -hmm. definitely something in between. Uh, there's some wiggle room for sure. Yeah. Um, other fellows, anyone else? There has to be more questions out there. I have more questions and comments, but uh, nobody wants to hear from me. Uh, anyone have any questions for Dr. Eckhouse? Comments, things you've seen, things done differently, anything at all? We won't bite. Thanks for the oh. time, Dr. Eckhouse. Uh, this is Jordan yeah. Duckett. I'm out of Toledo uh, Hospital with Dr. Matt Foreman. Um, for most of his, uh, we he just does the single anastomosis. But for answering the question for the, I guess when you're doing the two small bowel, small bowel anastomosis, um, he doesn't use any stay sutures. He usually parks his stapler kind of like in a toe up kind of position and then uses his two hands to place the bowel onto the staplers with it kind of propped up. So everything mm -hmm. kind of slides down onto it. And then he'll switch over back to the stapler to slowly close and kind of start to clamp. Um, but that's kind of one way he's gotten away from using uh, stays. Yeah. So I used to do that. Um, and then I went back while the anastomos of uh, the ilium. And okay. one of the things I hate doing is injuring the ilium. It just yeah. stresses me out because it's thinner, it's smaller caliber. Mm -hmm. And so I've gotten away from that, but that's of course, because you're only uh, my favorite phrase that I've created. You're only as good as your last complication, right? We make a lot of these subtle adjustments based on the last bad thing or bad outcome we've had. Um, that was one of the first ones I did um, that. And then backwalling when I was doing the duodenal ileostomy. So I've adjusted because of that, but it is a very in the right hands, which unfortunately I don't think are mine, but it's a really nice technique. And it's also really nice for JJ as well. 
-hmm. And then for um, your anastomosis from the duodenum to the ilium or jejunum, wherever you're connecting, do you do that over a bougie or any type of? No. Uh, okay. I do not. I do. And I do the same. Admittedly, there, what's you have a risk of backwalling, but I don't know if you notice, I keep it open. I'm very specific about being able to see in and out. And I do the same thing for my uh, gastrojejunostomy as well. Um, and so I don't use a bougie. Have I backwalled? Not robotically. Do I, uh, but I think partly because I keep it open. Will I probably at some point, um, because you when perform you perform an EGD at the end, Shana, I always perform an EGD at the end, which, um, I think it was in my specimen removal video, so I didn't show it, but I do, I put a clamp across the roux, um, and then I drive a scope through my duodenal ileostomy. Um, cause early in my experience, laparoscopically, I, uh, V-lock has a lot of um, elasticity or elastic recoil. And when cinching, I was real excited and cinched it too hard and completely obstructed my duodenal ileostomy. So you have to be careful also, um, mm -hmm. not to overdo it, especially when you're seeing with your eyes. Um, and so I always like to check for it as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. we do a, over a 32, uh, like, uh, Vizy G and then we'll do ICG through the, uh, Vizy G tube mm -hmm. for a leak test. Definitely a good idea. Other fellows, anyone else have questions, comments? Hey, let me just ask by a show of hands, how many of you fellows are doing robotic DS or Sadie at your program? Okay, so it's only a couple. How many of you would like to be? <laughs> Hopefully most, okay. So so this is great because I think there's a lot less experience with this e even in even in the fellowship programs. Shane, a quick question. You. Uh, I usually purposefully try to make my sleeve a little bigger on, a, especially on a DS. Mm -hmm. uh, do you use the same bougie for a sleeve no. uh, DS I, versus a regular sleeve? Regular <laughs> sleeve, I use a forty French bougie. Um, I use the thirty six, and we use the thirty six in fellowship. I switched to a forty just because that's what my partner used here, and, and for standardization, it made sense. For duodenal switches, I always do a fifty four French. Mm -hmm. And then I typically place it myself. Um, the benefit of the robot is I'm not scrubbed in. So I love going and putting the bougie in myself, uh, myself, especially when it's that larger bougie. And I use a tapered tip, not a blunt tip. Um, because we have had, uh, a few issues where, um, um, not in our group, but, uh, others placing a blunt tip bougie of that size have created, um, esophageal perforations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can cause lots of problems with the bougie. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Anyone learn how else? to troubleshoot the weird things that you don't think you need to troubleshoot, like how to put an NG tube in, how to put a bougie in, how to decompress the stomach when anesthesiology is struggling just because they have lots of other things going on. Um, uh, those are important. How to troubleshoot your stapler and um, your um, your instruments. Definitely. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Debbie from OHSU. Um, I think I don't understand uh, the difference in the size of the stomach if you're doing the um, DS versus um, a, a straight um, uh, sleeve gastrectomy. So uh, it, the thought process with it's a larger capacity because they need more protein. They need more nutrition because you've created a significantly more malabsorptive operation. We're bypassing all but anywhere between 225 to what I do, 350, uh, three to 550 centimeters in small intestines, um, which creates a significant, um, larger malabsorptive property, which is great for weight loss, but it's also a higher risk. And so you want them to be able to get that protein in those extra vitamins in. Um, so it makes it easier for them to accommodate a little bit more to overcome the malabsorption. Yeah. They'll lose over 80 to 90% of their excess body weight loss on average. Um, um, but you want to uh, mitigate that risk of uh, malnutrition. I think it's important just, there's no reason to get anywhere close to having a tight sleeve with a duodenal switch. I don't have big bougies, uh, that, uh, that size. So I just use the same size bougie, but I just kind of stay away from it as I'm stapling up. So obviously it's a, it's a poor man's big bougie. Um, but, uh, you know, there's no reason to make a super tight sleeve because you're only going to lead to problems down the road with this patient. So, yeah. Any other? Yeah. Problems? Yeah. I'd say your, your usual bariatric operations, your main concern should be failure of weight loss. This operation, your concern is <clears throat> onto the too much weight loss and malnutrition problems. Yeah. 
I think coming out of a, bar a fellowship that does bariatric surgery, technically you guys can do this operation. It's learning the steps and then um, uh, understanding kind of, you know, learning from your, your successors and your opportunities. The big thing that becomes important isn't the technical skill. Yes, that's important, but long-term it's your perioperative counseling and your long-term follow-up from a nutrition perspective. Um, since I've joined practice here, I've reversed nine duodenal switches, not none of them done by me, all done in the community. Um, one of them will never walk again from a B6 deficiency. One will never remember who I am from a B1 deficiency. And one of them um, is on the transplant list. And it's because they were managed. They had, uh, they developed nausea, vomiting quickly after surgery, and they weren't nutritionally optimized efficiently. And that efficiently efficiency is key all of them, those things started to occur within two months post-op. And so that follow-up after surgery is imperative. I am dogged with these patients. Um, if they don't show up, I'm calling them myself. Um, you don't want to know how many times I'm calling them myself um, because I think it's important. And if they don't answer, I call their emergency contact. Where are they? They need to show up. Um, uh, partly because it's not, um, most of the issues aren't going to be the technical issues. It's going to be the nutritional problems that come up. Yeah. And those I'm, may I'm not be very reversed. picky. I think setting expectations also preoperatively, right? If mm -hmm. there's a patient that you don't trust can even make their, you know, pre-op appointment or show up for their blood work. That's probably not a patient you're going to want to set up for a duodenal switch, no matter how badly they want it or how much they benefit from it. Cause, uh, once you've done the operation, yes. Is it technically reversible? Yeah. But you've, you've made your bed, so to speak. And then you're going to have, have a patient struggling for a long, long time. So, yeah. You, uh, I, I think that patient selection is something that's an opportunity for all of us. It's one of the hardest things to figure out to Dr. Shimke's point. Um, I, I, if they don't come in asking for it, I don't offer it. Um, it's not something, if you don't want it, it's not a good idea. Um, but if you want it and you're ready for it and they, they hit those metrics. Um, and then I even ask family, are they actually this, um, you know, compliant? Um, do you think they can do it? Cause I think it should be a family decision in these, in certain situations, um, then we move forward. Any other questions, uh, from anybody else? Maybe. All right. Matt, do you have anything else? No, that was fantastic. Great talk. Great videos. Shanna, thanks for moderating that. Scott. Awesome. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I, I've literally learned some, a lot of pointers and I'm going to have to talk to Shane offline about the vitamin and everything else. So there's always, no matter how much, uh, and how far you're into practice, there's always things you can uh, be learning from this. So it's a, it's a never ending, uh, a process. So, oh, yeah. um, changing um, really, really asked me every, um, <laughs> currently changed my JJ this year and I'm seven years into practice. Yep. Keep learning. Uh, Absolutely. and I did put those vitamins into the chat as well, but I'll send them to you, uh, Scott as well. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, um, so we'll see everyone next in person, which is exciting in Atlanta, uh, which will be exciting. We look forward to that as a kind of full disclosure. Um, if everyone's wondering why we're not going to go over a lot of duodenal switch stuff at the lab, uh, it has to do with FDA approval with the robot. So, uh, intuitive gets very, uh, gets very, uh, uncomfortable when you talk, start talking about the, uh, duodenal switch in front of them. Although apparently it's almost have to be, I think it is FDA approved now or just as FDA approved, um, but we're not going to do a lot of duodenal switch just for FDA reasons at this time, but uh, future sessions, hopefully we will be. So um, anyways, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shana. This was awesome. And we'll see everyone in Atlanta. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you.